Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as you know, we just had a steering committee meeting and made some decisions about funds going to various locations. We've covered those in some detail, so I won't go over them again. But uh, last year, we, we escaped the wrath of a major hurricane, but uh, we all know what to expect. We've had hurricanes and floods. We've, I think we've had 2,000-year floods in the last four or five years. We've had hurricanes ever since all of us have, have been alive. But the four major flooding disasters recently, uh, between 2012 and 2018, really hit us hard. There were 37 deaths. There were nearly 150,000 uh, excuse me, homes, and financially the cost was over $800 million. So clearly uh, we, ha we have had a good team working on these things, but we need to do more, and that's what we're, we're here to announce today. In 2018, I created the South Carolina Floodwater Commission. Some of you may have seen the book that is a result of their efforts. There were hundreds of people participating, all these volunteers from experts in a variety of fields. There were thousands of hours that went into the work, all volunteer producing a report which endeavors to address our many challenges in a comprehensive way. And one of the top recommendations there was consolidating our flood response under a single entity and having a single entity that can plan, prepare for the future in order that we can mitigate the damages that have happened to some of our people over and over every year, just as soon as they finish mucking out their, their house and moving the furniture back in, here comes another flood and they have to start all over again. That's actually happened in Marion County. Uh, Senate Bill 259 passed by the General Assembly and signed by me in 2020 created the South Carolina Office of Resilience. The South Carolina Floodwater Commission was, was led by Mr. Tom Mulliken, who's out of the country today and can't be with us. The Office of Resilience uh, and a Chief Resilience Officer appointed by the governor are in that legislation, and the job of that person will be to develop, implement, and maintain a statewide resilience plan with the goal of coordinating statewide resilience and disaster recovery efforts with federal, state, and local non-governmental entities and with volunteers and with whatever other assets there are that our state has to offer. Today, I'm pleased to announce that officer. That is Ben Duncan, right there. Ben Duncan has been with the Disaster Recovery Office since 2015 most recently serving as program manager director for the Office of Resilience. In that capacity, he has been responsible for overseeing these things, $450 million in community development block grants stemming from the severe storm in 2015, math, Hurricane Matthew in 2016, and Hurricane Florence in 2018. Also, he has led the effort for the repair replacement of over 2,800 homes damaged, damaged by flooding and other extreme weather events during that, that time. Uh, ben knows the interplay between the federal, state, and local governments because he's, he's worked so long in our state with great success. His institutional knowledge will be critical in this role as South Carolina's first Office of Resilience Director. Mr. Duncan held top positions in the South Carolina Department of Administration, the Department of Insurance, the Departments of Parks, Recreation, and Tourism, the State Budget and Control Board, the Governor's Office, and he's been in the, working in the government with exceptional service since 1987, 35 years. Did I leave out anything, Ben, all those? Uh, I don't think so. Don't think so. so we, are, we are fortunate to have a team, the team that we do, uh, and to have this office now consolidated under his leadership with the fine staff, many of who are here and have done excellent work over the years, uh, is a good day for South Carolina. We went over the, the money that is, was voted on earlier. Uh, so with that, I will ask Director Duncan to come forward.
First of all, I'd, I'd like to thank the governor uh, for his leadership in this crucial issue that we deal with on a daily basis here. Uh, and I want to thank him for his confidence in me uh, to, and to select me as a, a cabinet level uh, agency head. Uh, my passion in state government has always been to make a difference. And there's no better place to do so than in leading the South Carolina Office of Resilience. I would like to thank the bill sponsors, and a couple of them are here today, uh, for, and, the, and those in the House and the Senate uh, and the entire General Assembly for the importance of the, st the strategic statewide disaster risk reduction. And I want to thank them for the fast tracking of this uh, bill uh, during an exceptionally busy time uh, in, in two weeks of last session in last year. After the historic flood in 2015, the South Carolina uh, Disaster Recovery Office was formed with the primary mission to take an apolitical approach to returning disaster survivors to a safe, sanitary, and secure housing. And, and this was do primarily done by using HUD funds, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. In response to the 2015 uh, devastating impact uh, floods uh, and uh, Hurricane Matthew of 2016, over 2,800 families have been returned to their homes. And with, with the Hurricane Florence uh, program that we're getting off the ground now, that will be more than 3,300 families back into a safe, sanitary, and secure home. Over the past five years uh, of the Home Repair and Placement Model Program, other states have adopted our model. Uh, other states have come in from Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, and have adopted our program because it's a national standard right now. Disaster recovery is a reactive mission, though. Creating resilient communities require a proactive approach, and our federal partners have recognized this and made funding available to prevent future disaster damage by providing federal dollars to mitigate against hazards facing our state. Considering this, our mission has evolved to include mitigation activities designed to prevent and lessen uh, the severity of future disaster damage. We are currently conducting operations to improve the state's infrastructure and to address a historic flooding, uh, address historic flooding in our state and what we've experienced over the last few years. And we're doing this by removing citizens from homes from repetitive flooding areas, assisting local governments with developments of plans and studies to address flooding in their communities, and Governor McMaster recognized the importance of taking a proactive approach when he created the Flood Water Commission to study the effects of past disasters and make recommendations to improve our state's ability to absorb the impacts while minimizing disruptions to the lives of citizens and, the citizens and our businesses in our state. The Act establishes a cooperative framework for establishing risk Posed by, posed by different type future disasters. We are excited to expand on this work as part of the Office of Resilience. Furthermore, the Office of Resilience creates an excellent opportunity to leverage state resources, federal resources, and local resources, not only financially, but the impactful collaboration to collect, collectively solve these problems in our state. Many state, local, and federal agencies are involved, and there are many activities that are involved in what we do that, that fall under the Office of Resilience. But we have no single state entity responsible, responsible for coordinating the big picture and making sure all efforts work together in a common goal. And we have that today. There are some ambitious goals that are set for this office and we are ready to tackle them, including the development of statewide resilience plan, the conducting of the watershed study across the state, to establish a fund dedicated providing resources to prevent and respond to potential and actual disasters, establish a revolving loan fund 
to support local communities and buy out repetitive lost properties and returning it to natural state. And finally, for the coordination of local planning amendments, incorporate resi resiliency into planning activities. My team is ready. We're excited. Uh, and Governor McMaster, I want to thank you again for this opportunity to serve a state that I love so deeply. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Representative Crawford. She's going to come up and say a few words. Um, as we're all aware, flooding has put a huge strain on many of our communities across South Carolina. And this funding and this program is going to help areas like the one I represent in Horry County, the greater Saucus T area. Um, we've seen, seen relentless flooding over the years. And unfortunately, record amounts of rain have once again left families in my community of Saucus T over the last few weeks ravished by flooding. Many of them are out of their homes. This program is a step in the right direction so that these folks are not rebuilding homes in the same area that are flood prone that we know are going to flood again. They're not going to be rebuilding those homes. They can be relocating those homes, ultimately saving the taxpayers dollars. Um, Governor, I want to thank you for making flooding a priority. And I want to thank you for the South Carolina Floodwater Commission. I had the privilege of serving on that commission with you fellas and, and lots of folks from around our state. The research that was produced from that committee is so valuable. And so this legislation came out of that Floodwater Commission, as well as some of the relocation programs that we're currently working on. Um, and it's not just Horry County. So Horry County has flooding, Marion County has flooding, Charleston County has flooding, and we all have different issues. We all have different needs. So this office is going to be very helpful in addressing those needs across our state. And Governor, I want to thank you for Ben. Um, I cannot think of anyone that would be more qualified and well suited for this position. Um, ben, thank you and for everyone at DRO for all of your hard work. Um, ben takes my calls on Saturday morning, Sunday evening. Thanks for putting up with me over the last few years as we work on this. Um, so I appreciate it. I appreciate your dedication and your commitment to prioritizing this important issue. Um, I want to thank Senator Goldfinch as well, um, Horry County Councilman Crawford, as well as the Community Development Block Grant Office in Horry County. We have worked on this issue tirelessly to help our community and those in need. And this is a step in the right direction. So there's still a lot to be done. And uh, most importantly, I want to thank the flood families of Saucus T for their patience, because this has been a long process. But today, I'm, offer, I'm here, we are here to offer some help and some assistance, and it is on its way. So while we still have much left to be done, Governor Ben, Stephen, as we work to address these issues and address the flow of water from North Carolina, capturing, controlling that water, we have a lot to do, but we are heading in the right direction. So again, I thank all of you, everyone at DRO and Ben, Governor, Senator Goldfinch, everyone, thank you so much for your help and for everything that you've done. And thank you guys on the steering committee as well. This is definitely a step in the right direction. We have a lot to do, but we're getting there. So thank you. Oh, Senator Goldfinch. Senator Goldfinch. <laughs> Thank you very much. I know y'all are tired of hearing uh, multiple people talking, so I'll take my time and bore you to death. <laughs> I would like to begin by thanking Governor McMaster, uh, Representative Crawford, Ben Duncan, Marsha, and, and the steering committee, especially for today. Uh, representing Ori and Georgetown and Charleston counties, three of, of some of the most impacted communities in the state, it means an awful lot to me that we've taken this first step. Uh, the governor and I had a conversation, I don't know if you remember this governor, but it was maybe seven or eight years ago. I was pitching a very similar idea to the resilience bill seven or eight years ago, certainly had some modifications since then, and I was describing the devastation that the people in our community had felt when the rivers exceed their banks and and uh, 
and all the problems that come along with that. And I said something at the end. I said, it's even run the animals out. It's been devastating to nature, not just to humanity. And the governor looked at me and he said something he meant to be a joke. He said, Stephen, even the possums need a place to go. <laughs> and I thought that was a joke and I laughed at it and I left and I started thinking about it later and I said, you know, that's a man that actually gets environmental issues. Humanity does deserve a place to go, but even the possums deserve a place to go. And the floodwaters that we have today, sitting in the streets of Horry and Georgetown County today, are preventing that. They're preventing humans from living their lives the way they should, but they're also preventing even down to the possums, even down to the littlest creature that we don't even think about. And it's time for us to do something about it. Representative Crawford and I have asked Duke Energy and Cube Energy to come and, and testify in front of our committees in a couple weeks. To start that process, we, we are, are dealing with the after effects or dealing with the symptoms with this bill and, and creating this agency, and that is surely important. But we have to also understand the causation, which the Floodwater Commission has been instrumental in putting together. So it's time for us to start working as a team and time for us to start getting some answers. And this is the manifestation of that. And I cannot thank everybody here so much for getting us to where we are today. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. <clears throat> Before we have questions, just a couple of comments. Um, when you're, you're in your home or your vehicle and you're on the road or you're but you're close to the river or maybe not so close, and you see the water coming up and creeping up in your yard, and you know from the news that it's going to get higher, that is one of the strongest feelings of helplessness there is. And what this Floodwater Commission and what this Office of Resilience intends to do is to eliminate that feeling of, of hopelessness and keep our people safe and sound. I remember in one of the, one of the floods, I was in a helicopter and we were out in the country. It may have been may have been in Marion County, but we were flying over a road and we could see the water coming up in the fields. And we looked down and we saw a vehicle off on the side of the road, on the shoulder of a road going through the woods, and there were two men on top of it. And when we went around the first time, the water was up to about the door. When we went around the second and third time, the water was was up to the roof. And it was about that time that units from Department of Natural Resources, and I think some that had come up either from Louisiana or Florida, arrived. Were you in the plane with us that day? No, sir. That's one of the few days you haven't been looking at this. Uh, Kim Stinson knows as much about flooding and hurricanes as anybody on Earth. But it was, you talk about a feeling of helplessness when you're in the middle of, of the woods by yourself and the water's rising and rising that fast, it'll actually push a car off the road. That's, that's the kind of force of nature we're dealing with. So this office will be one that leads the effort to communicate, collaborate, and cooperate with all the partners, all those entities, all those people, including volunteers, cities, towns, and everyone in between to see that we, to the extent possible, that we eliminate that fear and that feeling of hopelessness by our people. Let, the, let them prosper and make uh, South Carolina just a little bit stronger and a little bit better. So with that, we'll be glad to answer your questions. Shauna? Director Duncan. Well, we'll be working with uh, with the legislature, uh, but they've already put uh, 50 million in a reserve fund. So there will be discussions in, 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 on the future uh, of other funding for this office. And how with, might that help get rebuild houses and, and get them out of those deplorable conditions you, you put up there faster? Well, we'll be going through a similar grants process like we're doing now. Um, and, and counties and, and municipalities can apply for those grants, uh, apply for the loans once the loan program is set up, and, and we'll be able to fund it that way. Question? Governor, I have a, a quick, uh, if I may, 
here for a quick second um, for you. Uh, obviously, uh, Monday was the, the start of the Phase 1B rollout and uh, the first first uh, for folks in that phase to, to get that shot. So how has that been going? And then also um, your decision to lift the mask order, order for restaurants and uh, official state buildings. You made that before Phase 1B could roll out. So how did that decision come into play? Well, that's a result of uh, our experience with the experience of the people, and we know the virus now. The numbers are all going down. The hospital admissions, those on ventilators with COVID in the hospital, the, the hospital uh, occupancy rates, which we were concerned about at the beginning, about running out of room. That's why the National Guard was, was ready to stand up auxiliary facilities. Uh, uh, they did not go up very high then. They went up later, but now they're going back down. All the numbers are going back down. The, the average infection rate uh, daily uh, goes up and down a little bit, but it's uh, somewhere around six or seven uh, percent. Sometimes it goes down to four percent. So that's good. And we've had a, we've had a lot of people vaccinated. Uh, we've had a lot of people that uh, have tested positive and that are, are over uh, with the, the virus, at least for with the antibodies for some future period don't know how long and a lot of other people we know at the beginning we, we understood that for everyone that tested positive that actually had a test and, and tested positive there, there was many there's four others out there who had the virus and maybe didn't know it because they were too young and too strong to, to notice it but uh, so if you add all that up but we, we see that it, 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 it was uh, it was time to to do that it what was the first part of your question how would you say phase one Oh, yeah, it's going very well. We, we had some bottlenecks at the beginning. There was a, a, a lack of communication or understanding. The one thing we had was the computer. They call it the VAMS, the Vaccination Administration something. Uh, every person that took a, had a dose, had a shot, had to be registered in that. And it was a very almost impossible machine to operate. So that, that put, uh, put a kink in the line there. But we've gotten over that, and everybody understands how they fit into the picture, and the number of doses have been steadily increasing, those coming into the state. Whereas at the beginning, we were getting about a, uh, when, when all the first and second doses of Moderna and Pfizer were coming in, we are getting about 120 doses, first and second, a week. Now we're getting about 110 first doses a week, followed by corresponding second doses. Uh, we've got about, I think it's around 700 locations, hospitals, pharmacies, doctor's offices. Some of them are just getting the uh, vaccine uh, now. Uh, 41, no, 40, 41,800 uh, doses of um, Janssen came in just uh, at the end of last week and the beginning of this week, so and those are in the pharmacies. So we have a great infrastructure. We haven't filled it all out yet because we don't have enough vaccine, but we're glad that we have the vaccine that, that we do. As you know, the Trump administration started the manufacturing of the vaccine, paying for it, before the Pfizer and Moderna were, were approved. So when that was approved, there was some vaccine to come. And the Biden administration has been pushing as well, and the number just keeps going up. So we hope that by May, uh, April. We know by the, later on in this month we'll get, be getting a lot more than we're getting now. And remember, the, the Janssen uh, vaccine is just one shot, so you just go and don't have to come back. The others you have to come back in either two or three weeks later, two, three or four weeks later. But it's, it's going smooth. I'd ask everybody to have patience. We know that from our statistics that the, the deaths that we've had in the state about 93 percent, somewhere around 93, maybe 94 percent, have been people that are 55 or older. So that, of course, is our, is our target population and others that have close contact in various ways, which are also in 1B. Yes, ma'am. The, the, the votes that we spent today, um, the buyback program or buyout program, is there a cap on that? Or how it's decided? What's the give of the Director Duncan. Yes, the 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 cap is two hundred fifty thousand dollar home. So that's the cap on that. And, 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 and that's it according to the county tax assessor's office, or how do you decide how this? How much it's the fair market value, is how it's determined. And that's prior to the disaster. 
So that's, that's a fair way to do it for the homeowner, because if you do it after a disaster, those home, those home prices have dropped. And you mentioned that uh, of the images you put on the screen, that those yes. people were living in those houses. Is that always the case, that they're living there while y'all are, um, y'all have been building houses? Uh, no, not, not in every case. In some of those homes, uh, people can't live because of mold and mildew, and they've already moved out there in with family or uh, in some cases, we, we put them in temporary housing while we're doing the construction. If I understood it correctly, this is the first phase of you guys doing these programs and, and deciding which ones to take and which ones not to fund? With the mitigation program, yes. 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 So then not, not the home repair and replacement. We've been doing that all along. So, well, then with the, the mitigation program, what's going to be the second phase? When are you guys going it, to... It will probably be a little later this year once we uh, get these grants out and make an assessment where we are. It will probably be the later... You know, around June, July, that we'll put, we'll send out for the second round of these grants. And what are the areas that are still, I know you said you're going to have to try to work with some of these areas that have projects that wouldn't necessarily be a good idea, but you're going to have to work with them. What are the areas where you're actually still trying to gauge and help these people develop these projects that would stem a disaster? Or a uh, some of our smaller counties, uh, the counties that don't have the resources that the larger counties have, Marlboro counties, Chesterfield, uh, Marion counties, those, those smaller counties uh, that we're, we're trying to reach out to to make sure that they get a fair shake in this. And we've met with them, uh, but sometimes we don't get the response that we need, and we've, been, and we've been encouraging them, and we are going to meet with them again to make sure this happens. Two more questions if there are. How, much, how quickly is this money going to get to these counties and cities? Uh, very quickly. <laughs> There, there's a process, and we, we'll get to it as quickly as possible. I don't see it taking longer than a month or two before they get the money. In some cases, faster than that. Yes. And, Governor, if I may ask you another question about masks and, and mask order and vaccines, would you listen sure. to that? If I could, sir. Uh, so, of course, you lifted the mask mandate for government buildings, and a lot of places still are lifting restaurants and businesses, but there are still plenty out there that are saying, despite what the state says, we're still following the mandate. What would you say to those businesses? I would say what the, what the state has done is that the state is, is not requiring it. That doesn't mean people shouldn't do it. The, 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 we know how the, to stay safe from this virus, and we, we're leaving it up to the individuals, the businesses, the offices, and there's very few stores out there that you can go in now that don't have a sign out front that says you, have, you need to wear a mask. So there's plenty of opportunities to, to wear a mask, to be reminded that you should wear one. And of course, everyone can, can make their own decision, but it was time to re remove those, those limits because they, had, at this point, have become unnecessary. The, the people know how to protect themselves, and the, the numbers are going down. They're getting better. We have nice weather outside. People can get outside. The buildings are, are ventilated, and so it was time. And if I may, sir, with the capacity limits being lifted, and I know you're saying we're, we have better weather, we know how to protect ourselves, but without kind of a government rule or a mandate to try to give these, these mandates and these businesses and rules mm -hmm. a little bit of teeth, saying that, hey, the, the government should say this, doesn't that make it a little more difficult for those businesses to Well, I notice there's no rule that you have to wear a mask in here right now and everybody's got them on. I mean, that's, that's the point. At some point where the government does not need to continue requiring and, uh, and, and uh, having officers uh, police those kind of things, it has become unnecessary at this point. So that's why we took those off. Thank you, everyone.